Well folks, it's time for another project, and this time it's another Panzer. This is the T-75 ES, the last crusty Panzer revamp that I did was a T-70. So it was a little bit earlier, it was the next model down from this one. It had a different dash, and it also was powered by a Briggs & Stratton. The T-75s, when those came out, they had Kohler K-181s in them, and they also had a shorter hood and a different style dash, as you can see if you look them up. So. I got this probably about three or four years ago when I bought out a guy's collection of Panzer tractors and I've since sold off most everything else except for this one and some other stuff right here. But I always wanted to build this one because I just like the rusty and crusty nature of it similar to that 8N revamp that I did over last summer. Same style, same character. So I do have a couple of engines to go into this. I have a couple of Kohlers that are Panzer specific that we can build up and get running for this along with the majority of the other parts to get everything going. But the tractor itself is pretty straight. The worst part about it is down underneath the seat where the battery box is rotted out, but uh, it's really not too bad otherwise. I am going to have to find a gas tank for it. And depending on what I do for an engine, whether it's electric or rope start, I'm definitely going to have to rewire some of the stuff under the dash because that's pretty well spent at this point. So anyways, let's take a walk down the hill see what we got to work with and pick out an engine. All right, so here's the spare Panzer engines that I have. As you can see, there is a Briggs here for a T-70. So out of these two Kohler K-181s, that one over there and this one here, I am gonna be using this one. It seems to be the most complete original one. It has the original metal tag on the side of it, whereas that one has a sticker on it. So it was either a replacement shroud or a replacement engine that somebody swapped onto their Panzer. So the bore on this thing looks pretty good. It might be glazed, but it's not scored up or anything. It is going to need quite a bit of cleaning up. So we'll get this down to the garage and start pulling everything apart. So the first thing I'm going to do to this before we start delving into it is get the thing cleaned up some. So I'm going to get all the shrouds and everything pulled off of it. I do have a good used head gasket that I'm going to tighten the head down with. And then I'm going to take it outside and power wash it and see if I can get some of this grease and crap and everything else that's stuck to it off. That way it'll be a little bit easier to work on. Engine cleaned up well after a nice power washing. Got the majority of all the grease and all the other crap that was stuck to it off of there so we have a nice clean engine to work with. So the first thing that I'm going to do is get the head of this block all cleaned up along with the cylinder. That way I can measure everything and see where we're at. The valves I was planning on pulling out and lapping them in, but this does roll over with quite a bit of compression once the head is tightened down and everything as I had that on there to power wash it. So the valve seats and everything look good along with the faces on the valve. So I think with just a quick scrubbing down, I can leave those as they are and won't have to worry about them. And then of course, I also have to clean up the head of the engine itself. And for that, we're gonna scrape that down and run it through the glass bead blaster and get that all shined back up again. So the head's cleaning up nicely on this and it turns out I'm just going to pull the valves out and do this right the first time rather than trying to clean them up and then hope everything seals and then of course I can get all the carbon off of the faces and I can run them over the wire wheel that way they clean up nice. So to get the valve covers off on these Kohlers, at least on the eight horses, you got to pull the fuel pump off because it goes right past the cover here on the front. We'll have to look at that later and see if that's any good. Most of the time you don't have to pull the governor arm off. If you pull it backwards like this, you can sneak the plate for the breather cover off. Like so.
as you can see this engine has been sitting around for a little while we do have some moisture rust and build up inside of the valve cover here along with the stuff that's on the spring so it has been kicking around for a bit there's also a lot of kind of just goopy stuff on the base of the valve cover orifice here down inside the cavity and not so much of it because i keep wiping my finger on it but that stuff's going to have to get cleaned out of there and if it's there there's a good chance that it might also be in the oil pan too so most likely once we get the top end of the engine squared away i'm going to pop the oil pan off and just make sure there's not any gloppy stuff in there that'll get kicked up when we start this so we'll get these valves pulled out of here and see how everything looks So the stems, hopefully you can see it, the stems definitely have some wear on them. You can see where they stop at the edge of the guide right there, but there's no lip. I can't catch it with my nail or anything, so I can still use these valves. They do have a pretty fair amount of, whoops, pretty fair amount of carbon on them. So those will have to get cleaned up. But the faces on them don't look pitted. So those should be salvageable, if not, I do have a way to recut those on a little hokey valve face cutter that I have because I don't have room for a formal machine yet. And then of course there's a pretty fair amount of carbon buildup on the intake port so that'll get all scraped out as well. The exhaust valve stem looks about the same. There is a very tiny ridge on the bottom but not enough to make any of a difference and of course it's carboned up pretty good and the face on this one actually does have quite a bit of carbon on it so i am glad i pulled these off because they definitely or pulled them out because they definitely have to get cleaned up without question the seat does look good though there is absolutely no pitting on it it's very clean i don't know if these are stellite seats on this because that has a seat in it, this one does not. This one's cut straight into the head. And this one, it's got some carbon and crap built up on it, but I think that'll clean up just fine. And then of course we'll clean all the carbon out of the exhaust port as well while we're here. <clears throat> top of the cylinder block cleaned up really nice. Everything decarboned very well and shined right back up again. The cylinder I was able to decarbon everything and get that cleaned up just a little bit towards the top. There was a bit of rust going around the inside of it so it was either sitting like that for a while or it quite possibly might have had a little bit of water in there at one point. So I took a snap gauge and I ended up measuring this and this cylinder is at 2.938 for the bore right now so it's just about on point depending on where you measure it it's like a half a thou more or it's 2.939 so right here are the tolerances for the k181 Kohler and that's my wear limit so I only have a three thou wear limit on these cylinders and what I've found on all the k181s that I've rebuilt over the years that these engines the small block Kohlers the cylinder can remain in tolerance and then they will start smoking. The big blocks, the cylinder will cut out of tolerance and it'll be worn over and they still won't smoke. So I don't know if it was the rings that they used on the smaller ones or it's just the way it is. But that's what I've always found with them. But aside from that, the cylinder is still good. Whether the rings will seat with the condition of the inside of this, I really don't know. But I'm not going to go as far to pull this all apart and hone it out for what it is. So we're going to leave it as it is. So I have all my valve stuff cleaned up. The valves lapped in really nicely. I have good seats on them now. There's just a tiny little bit of pitting on the exhaust, but you can barely even see it. I don't know if that's going to pick it up or not, but right where the lap mark is, it's really hardly even noticeable, but I noticed it. So I ran that a couple of times, and that seems like it cleaned up just fine. And then, of course, the seats in the engine cleaned up very well, too along with the exhaust one. So those are all good. The ports and everything, I decarboned all those. So those are nice and clean. 
and of course the breather covers and everything I ran through the parts washer so those are ready to go back on as well so now we can start assembling the valve train the Kohler K181s also don't have adjustable lifters on them unlike the 10 through 18 horse single cylinders so when you have to clearance these valves you either have to cut the seats up top lap them in or you end up having to grind these stems down which is what I have to do to the intake because the intake clearance is six to eight thousandths and I have three on the intake right now the exhaust luckily is good enough that is 17 to 19 and it's at a snug 18 right now 17 and a half 18 so that'll be fine just the way it is so what I do for these and I think I have a video clip of it that I'll throw in here because I filmed it once is I set up a jig in the drill press with a little drum sander to clearance these when I'm rebuilding these engines because it's about as accurate as I can get because I don't have a milling machine yet and that's what I use to shave down these stems. So if I don't do that I end up setting them up just in the vise over here and I'll clearance them with the file just a little bit at a time because it doesn't take much to take these stems down and then all of a sudden you have a gap that's too big on the valve clearance. So for now we're going to clamp this into the vise and clearance it with the file instead. So what I went ahead and did is I put my valve spring and my keeper inside of here and then I can set my valve down inside. Now I know unfortunately <clears throat> you guys won't be able to see that much from there up close but it'll be better than sitting on the side of the bench over that way where I had you before. So I just keep the screwdriver underneath the keeper that way it, I can get the fork underneath there on the valve spring compressor. So when you go to put the two little keepers on, the ones that go on the valve stems, which would be these, hopefully you guys can see those. About the easiest way I've found to do this, some of you might already know this, is you put a little bit of grease on a long skinny screwdriver and then you just put some grease on the back sides of these keepers, like so. And then you can stick the keeper to the screwdriver like that and then fish it up underneath onto the valve stem and the grease on the back side of it will hold it to the valve stem while you get everything positioned. So I suppose the little plate on the bottom of the spring would be the valve spring retainer rather than the valve spring keeper. I should have said that first but I'm not going to go back and do this video clip again. Alright, so everything's set in there nice. The keepers are hugging the valves stem just fine. And the spring's set in there. So now we can do the same thing with the intake. So you have the valve spring retainer, valve spring. You can feed that up over the guide. Stuff the screwdriver underneath it, pop it over the lifter, keep the screwdriver there, that way you can get the fork for the valve spring compressor into it. Make sure you oil up the stem of the valve just a little bit. Feed that all the way in. And the valve spring compressor. And we'll do the same thing with the two keepers on the intake side as well. And you don't need much grease. They'll hang on there with just a little bit, just enough to make it tack. You don't have to have so much on there, it's mushing out all over the place because then it ends up causing you more problems than good. And there you have it folks. Valve train's all installed. So now we can get our cover bolted back on. Make sure that's all squared away. Keep moving along on this engine. Now that our valve train's all set and the head of the engine is cleaned up, I do want to pull the oil pan on this thing and 
make sure it doesn't have too much sludging crap in it, being that it's been sitting around for a while. So I went and got a new oil pan gasket inside so we can change that out. I haven't drained the oil out of this because it doesn't have much left in it, so I'll just tip it once I pull the block off and then we can scrape everything out. So everything looks pretty darn good inside of this thing. A little bit of surface rust on the inside wall here. And it's just, it's caked in that, the really old oil that smells like wax. Some of you guys might know that work on older equipment. So it hasn't been ran in an awful long time if it's got that kind of oil in it that smells like that. So the majority of it is pretty darn clean. There's a lot of just junk stuck to it on the inside. As you can see, there's just like a residual of oil everywhere on everything. So I'm not that worried about it. That's gonna get washed out with the new oil. And then I just change the oil again and it should be fine. Cause it's really, it's not too bad. It'll all, it'll all come off when everything splashes through it. And of course the oil pan will dump that and see what's at the bottom of it. All right, folks. So this is the reason why you gotta pull oil pans on older engines that have been sitting for a long time. Now, I'll be flat out, I didn't used to do this for quite a while until Colin kind of got on me on it to start pulling the oil pans because there's always sludge in older engines. And he's definitely right because after I drained off all that oil, this is what we have sitting on the bottom of it. That's probably a good quarter inch, a three sixteenths of just crap. <laughs> really bad stuff as you can see. So it was probably just stuff from the engine and a moisture buildup and everything just kind of formed a nasty sludge at the bottom of this oil pan. So if you don't pull it and clean all that out, put some fresh oil in, that is going to end up all over the inside of this engine and it's not going to do it any favors. That's the stuff that'll end up plugging up connecting rod oil holes and then you end up blowing the rod out of it. And then you have to rebuild it or replace the block because the rod went through the side of it. So you got to clean this stuff out, folks. So we'll scrape all this stuff out of here, we'll wipe everything clean, and then we can get this oil pan bolted back into it. So I'll wipe everything that I can out of here like this. Get all the heavy stuff out, scrape out what I can. And then I'll splash some parts washer fluid in there and just scrub the rest of it out. And in the meantime, while the oil pan is drying after we ran through the parts washer, we might as well get the bottom of the block all prepped and this gasket scraped off of here. That way we can remount the oil pan. Before I go ahead and bolt this oil pan back on, I am going to peen over these rivets for these isolation engine mounts because these tend to loosen up, as you can see right here, over time. And some of you that own Panzers, you'll know that these will snap off or the rivets will come out or they'll the rubber will rip out of the metal piece right here. So I'm just going to set them on the vise and smack them down this way and then I can set them on this piece of bar stock on here and I can just peen the heads over on this side, that way I can secure them. Worst case, if the rivets were bad, you can use 1024 bolts in there to hold them on. And if anybody needs these mounts brand new, I believe that Lord makes them. It's a plate form mount, and I had to buy these new for a Panzer I restored for a customer about six or seven years ago, I think. And they do still make them, but it takes a little bit of searching around to find them. All right, our oil pan's all cleaned out, ready to go. And of course, like with every engine that I pull apart or piece of equipment, I put my name and the date on the inside of it, or if I'm doing something for work, it gets the business name and the phone number and the date on when everything was done. So we got our new oil pan gasket. And the block is all cleaned off, oil pan's all cleaned off, so we're ready to set this back on here and bolt it down. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now that our engine's back on the oil pan, I can work on getting this head cleaned up. So I'm going to scrape off everything that I can, and then I'll run it through the glass bead blaster. Head cleaned up nicely in the glass bead blaster, so that's all decarboned and ready to be mounted up. I have the two studs mounted back in the engine head. And of course our new gasket, which is ready to go. So the Kohler K141, 161, and 181 have that torque pattern for the head, for those of you who don't know it or can't find it online anywhere. So they get torqued down to 15 to 20 foot-pounds in that sequence. And that's just what we're going to do to this one. Next thing to take care of is going to be the ignition system. And this Kohler has the magneto ignition system that rides underneath the flywheel on the crankshaft versus a regular 12 volt automotive style coil ignition, which is nice because if I decide not to make this electric start, I can just pull start it and save myself from having to put a battery on it, which would be nice. So I ended up rounding up all the parts for this. I do have a new points cover gasket, points, I found a cover, I have the hardware push rod and all that good stuff. But one thing I do want to do is replace this wire that runs from the points over to the condenser here on the armature because the end of it someone had taped up and it looks like it's been cut at one point. So while we're here, we might as well replace that. And then once that's done, we can start assembling the rest of the ignition system. New wire has been installed over to the coil and down into the points. Points are also installed and gapped at 20 thousandths. So before I get too far ahead of myself and close everything up, I am going to mount up my flywheel onto this and check for spark to make sure we have a good coil and armature. So if nothing else, you guys can hear it snapping across there. So we do have a good hot spark. So now I can put on my points cover and then the ignition system is all squared away. Last thing we have to do is address the fuel system on this. So I have the fuel pump carburetor and a brand new fuel pump diaphragm and the feed line that goes from the pump to the carb. I don't know if I'm going to reuse this feed line or not. I do have new rubber grommets inside, but most likely I'm just going to put a couple of 90 degree fittings on here with a piece of rubber line that spans in between the pump and the carburetor. The carburetor is definitely going to have to get rebuilt and ran through the glass bead blaster definitely been kicking around for a little while so we'll get this disassembled and see how it looks inside so with the exception of knocking the main jet out of the carburetor body everything else has been disassembled and it's actually in pretty darn good shape on the inside so it looks like it just had a little bit of gas sitting in it at one point that evaporated or somebody actually shut the fuel off on it because the casting is very nice and clean it's not all shellacked up or crusted up or anything like that the worst part about it is actually down inside the ventry and inside the throat of the carburetor the choke butterfly is stuck and the throttle is actually pretty stiff but it does move so the bowl has a little bit of build up on it the float i'm going to clean up i might change that out and it's obviously going to get a new kit with gaskets and everything needles and everything have to get cleaned up and i'll run the air cleaner housing through the parts washer but one thing I did want to note on these 8 horse carburetors for the Kohlers, and this goes for the same for the 6 and the 7s, is unlike the 10 through 18 horses, they don't have a removable, well, they have a removable main jet, but you can't do it with a screwdriver. It's not a flat head. It's pressed into the, into the bowl stem on the bottom. So you can press them out, but you have to have a punch that fits the ID of the hole in the top of the bowl stem, which would be the OD of that jet if that makes any sense because you have to take out your main needle on the top right there and then this goes down inside and whether you will be able to see it might be kind of tough but you'll feel it set right into the machined hole where that jet goes down inside and then you can drive it straight through without destroying the body of the carburetor or the main jet but you have to have the right size punch in order to do that so i'm going to knock that out 
and then I'll run this through the glass bead blaster and we'll be ready for reassembly. Carburetor cleaned up nicely and that's all ready to go back together. Inside of it all blasted out real nice, all nice and clean again. Got down inside the bowl stem along with down inside the throat of the carburetor and the butterflies. So those are all moving like they should now, nice and easily. And I did just go over the outside edge of it really lightly. I held the gun back a ways and just blasted it real quick. That way I could retain at least a little bit of the blue paint, which this is going to get clear coated anyways but when I do these for customers and for work of course they all get blasted like this gravely carb that I did right back down to the castings and then everything gets clear coated so obviously if that was a job that came in it would get done in its entirety so I do have my carburetor kit here ready to go and all the other components cleaned up the float I believe is still good I don't see any breaks in the solder and it doesn't sound like it's got anything inside of it it still has a nice ting to it when you drop it doesn't sound usually when they have a crack in them or a hole or something they have a dull thud more than that ting but every once in a while and I also have the main jet that's all cleaned up so I'll show you guys how to put that back in as well so when you go to reassemble these carburetors and you have to press this main jet back into the bowl stem what you want to do is get a punch that's just about the same diameter as the head on the stem because these are tapered right down inside I think it's a tapered head here and there's a good chance it might be tapered inside of here as well so what you want to do is just drop that one make sure that you're sitting flush on this area right here not on the throttle shaft you can drop that down inside like so and then that gets pressed in with a hammer you can tap it right down and you'll hear it and you'll feel it when it stops you don't want to send the thing home because you'll push it right through the carburetor body, but you'll feel it when it stops, and it's pretty simple as that, folks. That's how you set the main jet back in there. Carburetor is all reassembled and back together and ready for some clear coat. So just as a side note, the main jet on the top here I usually set to one and a half to two turns out, and then the one here on the side gets set to one to one and a half. And that, of course, varies depending upon horsepower, but it gets you pretty darn close on the eight horses. And on the 10 horses and up, it's usually two on the idle jet on the side, and then the main jet on the top, it's usually two to three, depending on how the thing was machined and, of course, how it runs. And our fuel pump here is next, which, if all possible, I would like to re resurrect this versus putting a newer plastic pump on it, because I can still get new diaphragms for these. The check valves are another story. I know there's one site online that has them, but I haven't tried ordering them yet to see how they are when they come through. But I do have the new diaphragms. Yeah, so that's, that's all solidified from all the gas over the years. So unfortunately, that's not any good. But the top half of the fuel pump body does look to be in very nice shape. And the check valves are still moving. I don't know about that one, but I can test that one afterwards. So this should be a pretty easy cleanup. I'm gonna pull these fittings out of here, run this through the parts washer, get everything cleaned up and degreased. Everything's all cleaned up and ready to go back together. So two things to note with these new fangled fuel pump diaphragms is these were made for the plastic fuel pumps. The I think they'll fit the new age ones that are made overseas, the crappy ones that nobody likes. And they'll also fit the Bakelite pumps that were made from, I think, late 70s up until the 90s that had the 8th inch NPT holes on them, which would have been the Kohler replacement for the metal pumps. So the only thing that you have to do on these to get them to fit is you have to punch the holes about a half, half a hole width to two-thirds of a width in to get them to line up with the metal pumps. And then this tang that sticks down the bottom that hooks into the fork for the arm that actuates everything you have to shave off just a little bit on this T on either side and then just a little bit in the middle here. Bring everything in just a tiny bit and then it'll fit through the fork on the actuating lever on the fuel pump 
and to be able to mount your diaphragm in an old style metal Kohler fuel pump. Fuel pump is all back together and if you guys can hear that, the check valves are moving, the diaphragm is doing what it should. So we have a nice pump to draw fuel in. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is get the rest of this engine back together. I do have to clean up a couple of the shrouds, get everything bolted back on here. The carburetor is drying from two quick coats of clear. So that'll be ready before too long and I can mount that up as well. I already filled it up with oil this morning and put a small drain elbow on there to get past the frame rails once it's mounted into the tractor. So I'll get this all wrapped back up and I'll check back with you guys once it's on the bench and ready to fire up. Well, folks, you can't beat a good old Color K series. So we have ourselves a nice run on eight horse to put into this Pennsylvania Panzer. When I first got this to run, you might have been able to hear it. It was firing a little bit hard, and these early Kohler K181s and small block Kohlers didn't have a decompression lobe on the cam like the newer ones do. Instead, they had a timing advance lobe on the back of the camshaft with flyweights on the back of the gear, and I believe that was stuck, so the timing was a little bit off. I revved it a couple of times and everything seemed to smooth out. You'll hear that in the video. And the governor did the same thing. It was a little bit sticky and it wasn't working. Put it back into adjustment and everything. Revved it a couple of times and that started working just as it should. So we have a nice solid engine now. So everything ran well. There was a little bit of smoke upon startup. But that all burnt off of there. And there's no knocks or noise or anything like that out of it. So it's a good solid Kohler 8 horse. So that's going to be it for part 1. In part two, we're gonna go get the wheel horse tow truck, bring it up the hill and drag that carcass down here, get it into the garage, and then we can start all the work on that in preparation to drop this engine into it. So anyways, folks, there you have it.